I just got it. This meeting is being live streamed. Me too. Okay. I think that means we're good to go, which is exciting because it is the first Cocktails and Fish Tales of 2022. We're here live on Facebook with Peter Hodum um, and myself, Stina Troyer. As always, we love to know where you're tuning in from. So if you want to write in the comments where you're watching from, maybe what beverage you're drinking, whether it's a cocktail or a mocktail, uh, for the past over a year now, we've been doing these events virtually. And so uh, typically we, you know, meet at a local brewery, bring everybody together, but you know, gotta love this technology. And we're still coming to you virtually uh, for at least the first part of 2022. And so we're kicking it off here with Peter. And so Peter, we always like to ask our presenters if they will share their favorite cocktail or mocktail and their wildest fish tale. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, given that I'm presenting and I'm still in my office at the university, um, my beverage of choice is water. Um, but at home, I go crazy with kombucha, I guess. That's, I have, uh, I'm not very sophisticated when it comes to cocktails. Um, and favorite fish story, uh, given that I work on seabirds and have for decades, I've seen a lot of fish in various configurations from mealy digested mush, former fish, to, uh, to fish that are still trying to avoid avian predators. But um, one, uh, one story that jumps to mind is years ago, I was sea kayaking in Monterey Bay and in the kelp, on the edge of the kelp bed, I saw a dead branch cormorant. And so being an ecologist, I went over and I picked it up and um, its cause of death was very apparent because in its bill was wedged a fish that was patently considerably too big for it to swallow. Um, and so, and I actually tried to remove the fish forcibly from the bill and I couldn't. So this cormorant had eyes that were too big for its gullet and unfortunately uh, caused the mortality of both the fish and itself. Womp, womp. Well, that is quite the, <laughs> quite the fish tale for that lovely uh, sad bird story. Uh, <laughs> <thanks Peter. laughs> um, and again, so it looks like um, kind of how this evening works is I monitor the Facebook page as you're writing in questions and comments while Peter does his presentation here. And um, I will filter those over at the end so you can have your questions answered live tonight. Uh, I saw, first saw Peter do a presentation as part of the Puget Sound Seabird Survey. So Peter is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to seabirds. And then most recently at a South Sound Surfrider event where we got to learn all about puffins and petrels. And I don't know, I hope it's like the good word of the seabird seek Peter out here. So we're so <laughs> excited that we get to, you know, host you and have you share your knowledge on some of these uh, fabulous feathered friends with us tonight. So I'm going to let you share your screen again for those of you tuning in, write your questions, share your love, tell us where you're tuning in from in the comments, uh, and we'll come back to you all at the end. But for now, I'll turn it over to Peter. Okay, thank you, Stina. And can you see that? the screen now? Great. Your screen. You're looking um, good. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I, I do want to say right up front that my, my wife and 10 year old daughter and I are huge fans of Harbor Wild Watch. We love the work that the organization does. Um, our daughter, I think, has watched every video that you have that you have online multiple times. Um, so it's it's a wonderful opportunity to to be able to to give this presentation um, and uh, and to a captive audience that you know is open to hearing about seabirds, which is one of my favorite topics in the world. So um, tonight I'm going to talk about um, a few different species. Uh, several of them are shown here: uh, tufted puffin in the upper left, rhinoceros auklet, which, despite its name, is actually a puffin, um, functionally speaking and taxonomically speaking. And then um, at the very end of the talk, I'm going to speak a little bit about marbled merlets and some cool stuff that we're beginning to find out about them right here in the South Sound. Um, and hopefully in, in, uh, engender some interest from folks and possibly going out and doing some work together and better understanding how they use our, our region in the South Sound. But 
that's a, a little teaser um, to, to keep you keep you attentive. Um, so in terms of how I want to <clears throat> the general layout of, of uh, my presentation this evening, I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about islands of the outer coast um, and islands of the Salish Sea. Um, and then that will lead into um, an overview of the ecology of seabirds, because I think they're, um, they're a group of, of birds that are kind of understudied, underappreciated in my humble opinion, and, and not as well understood as many other groups of birds. And so give a little, a quick, um, abbreviated version of the life history of seabirds, which will then kind of inform our conversation about what do we know about seabirds in this region? Uh, how are they faring? And then use a few focal seabirds and islands to talk about work that I'm involved with with some of my colleagues. A uh, little bit about threats. What do we know about what, what problems confront seabirds in our region? And then looking forward. And the looking forward part will include uh, this little, this little um, pitch for marbled merlets in our area. So I'm gonna start with the outer coast of Washington. And uh, I just want everybody to know that to get out to these islands where we work, um, it requires risking life and limb and to run, you know, to run the, the gauntlet from vampire territory to werewolf territory. Um, my daughter's not old enough to have read these books yet. Some of you may have had children that read the Twilight series or watched the movies. This is on the way out to La Push on the outer coast of Washington. Um, it's the treaty line between the vampires, um, which are inland, and the werewolves, which inhabit uh, the Quileute nation uh, lands. So just to know you know, the, the degree to which we will risk our own well-being to do the work that I'm about to talk about. Um, the outer coast of Washington is, it's stunning. Um, some of you may have had a chance to, to be out on a boat or hike some of the coast. And you know, there, we don't have any large islands, but it's just populated with dozens and dozens of these small steep islands that have been scoured and sculpted and pounded for thousands and thousands of years by the Pacific Ocean. Um, so, I have a few photos here, just, I'm not gonna talk in detail about them, but just to give you, for those of you that haven't had a chance to really spend time out in the outer coast and see some of these islands, to give you a sense of how rugged they are, um, how steep they are, how inaccessible they are in many respects. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we even get onto an island like this and find out what's breeding on the island? Uh, <clears throat> questions as fundamental as that are problematic. Um, one of the wonderful things about the islands of the outer coast of Washington is that virtually all of them are protected as part of the Washington Maritime National Wildlife Refuge Complex, which means that they're closed access. Um, there's no public access to these islands. You need special permits from Fish and Wildlife Service to, to access them. And they have very rigorous requirements about the, the type of work that they allow on the islands. But as a consequence of the difficulty of accessing them logistically, as well as their strict protected status, we know very little about what's going on on these islands in many respects. Within the Salish Sea, we have also a, a large number of islands, including the San Juans. Um, this is a photo of Protection Island, which is also part of that National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Um, we've been working here since 2006 on, on several species, and I'll uh, refer to some of that work a little bit later, but this is as impacted as it has been, it is still a remarkable jewel in our region for biodiversity, uh, a really wonderful resource that we have. And, and, uh, and I think it's, it's frequently underappreciated. So Protection Island is right at the, it's between the mouth of Discovery Bay and Swim Bay. And uh, the photo here is taken early morning the point here, just around this point, if you're not fully oriented, is uh, Port Townsend. So Port Townsend is just a few miles to the east of Protection Island. Um, another prominent island for marine life and seabirds, also part of the National Wildlife Refuge Complex, is Smith Island. 
And Smith Island is located, <clears throat> excuse me, um, offshore the, the northern end of Whidbey Island. Almost, well, it's, it's southwest or south, west southwest of um, Deception Pass State Park. I'm kind of off Whidbey Naval Air Station, a few miles offshore, um, also federally protected, also an island that has really rich bird life um, and, uh, and some fascinating plant communities. So I'm gonna, a lot of the work, when I get to the work that we're involved with, these are islands on which uh, a lot of this work has been conducted over the years. So that, with that kind of quick, hopefully that whets your appetite and you're like, oh, those look like pretty awesome places to spend time. And I've been very fortunate over the, over the years to, to spend months, you know, many months of my life working on these islands um, and the seabird communities, as well as other aspects of their, their natural history. Um, but I, I um, over the years in giving talks, I, I've realized that not everybody, and probably for very healthy reasons, is, a, is as obsessed with seabirds as I am. And so um, I, I want to give a little bit of information about an overview of the natural history of seabirds, because it informs how we think about conserving them and the implications of impacts on seabirds for their long-term viability. So the group of seabirds is actually quite diverse, um, and it includes over 300 species. And they range in terms of their distribution from inshore species to highly pelagic. And pelagic simply means out in the open ocean, out beyond the continental shelf, kind of blue water, deep water. Um, so we have in Washington waters, we have that full extreme represented. So inshore species are things like pigeon guillemots, which if you've spent any time and assuming you know, you're here at Harbor Wild Watch, so I presume you, are uh, very interested in our inshore waters and, and marine natural history, you will assuredly have seen pigeon guillemots in our inshore waters. Just, just in that uh, subtidal zone, they're diving alcid, so they're in the same family as puffins, black with the white wing patches. I've got a picture of them later. Um, to highly pelagic, so if you were to do a, a seabird, a pelagic seabird trip out of Westport or out of Mia Bay, and you went offshore a few miles, you would see things like petrels, shearwaters, albatrosses. These are species that are highly pelagic. They spend virtually their whole lives at sea and usually far out of sight of land. So seabirds range using everything from the intertidal zone all the way out into you know, what we consider to be very inaccessible parts of the world in the open deep water oceans. They are also very long lived, meaning they have high adult survival. Most seabird species, um, and this is assuming that they, the, the young pass through the gauntlet. So the highest mortality of seabirds occurs when they're young, not surprisingly, um, when they're figuring out how to make a living. That's when they're most vulnerable. Once they reach adulthood, they tend to survive very well, frequently 90% or higher annual survival. Um, and that means that you have a population which is um, comprised of experienced, successful adults, and that's really key to the long-term viability of populations is that high adult survival. And that adult survival can extend out to 70 plus years in some species of albatrosses. So essentially the, almost the same life, life expectancy of humans um, for some of the more extreme seabirds. Associated with that is that they have what's called deferred sexual maturity. And a way to think about this is, you know, we can compare it with um, like a, a songbird that we might have in our backyard, you know, a, a white crowned sparrow, for example. Um, they, if they survive, again, that fledging period and they're lucky enough or good enough to make it to their first year, they are breeding um, because they don't live long. Most songbirds only live, if they ad reach adulthood, they only live one to three or four years. Um, so short adult survival or low adult survival. And because they don't have many opportunities to breed, they breed early and they breed rapidly. So seabirds are the other extreme of that. Once they've gone through that gauntlet of survival as young birds, 
they're still learning and acquiring experience and skill, the skills required to breed successfully. So they tend to push it off for a number of years, typically three to 10 years before they begin to breed. But when they begin to breed, they may well count on 15, 20, 30, 40 years of breeding opportunities. Tied into that is another really fascinating piece of this life history strategy. So it takes a long time to, for them to begin to breed, but they get to breed a number of years. And what they really focus on in this, this type of life history strategy is producing fewer, higher quality offspring. So many seabirds lay one to two eggs a year and they can't replace those, that egg or those eggs if they're lost. Um, some of the, the more productive um, seabirds will lay three and in the case of a few albatross, I mean, a few um, cormorant species may actually lay even up to four or five, although that's the exception rather than the norm. So you have a strategy that is really dependent on high adult survival they don't reproduce for a number of years. When they do reproduce, they reproduce at a low rate, but that they can kind of count on, evolutionarily speaking, to be able to reproduce for a number of years um, before they reach their kind of life expectancy. They're also primarily migratory, and that migration might be local. It might be kind of within the Salish Sea. So for example, pigeon guillemots do migrate but a lot of them do stay within the Salish Sea. They just kind of displace themselves a bit within the Salish Sea. Um, <clears throat> other species are incredibly highly migratory, uh, including like albatross species that will change ocean basins. Some species of shearwaters will, that breed in the Southern hemisphere, go all the way up into Arctic waters, into the Bering Sea, into the Aleutian Islands between breeding seasons. So they're going, traversing the entire length of the Pacific Ocean during their winter, our summer, and then traverse back down in time for the next breeding season. So all of this ties into what you can kind of think of as very complex life histories. Many species move across vast spatial scales um, using very different parts of the ocean. Uh, and then on top of that, they have this complex, long life expectancy that ties into how they um, have evolved their reproductive strategies. All of this then has implications for conservation. If we think about what does this mean if a bird can only produce one offspring a year? What does this mean if the stability of a population over time depends on high adult survival, but adults are being caught in fisheries? What does it mean if even under ideal circumstances, the young that are produced this year aren't even going to begin to breed for seven years or eight years? Um, this means that for most seabirds, even under ideal conditions, their capacity to build or grow their population is very slow, which makes them inherently vulnerable to disturbances, things that disrupt the, that life history. So, Let's look at seabirds in Washington state. So we can think about the Salish Sea, which is really these, you know, it's an inland sea, as, as you all know, it includes the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the Strait of Georgia, which is up um, across the border from us, and then Puget Sound. Oceanographically speaking, that's a very different ocean regime than the outer coast. Um, it's essentially, a giant estuary, and it's not influenced by all of the same oceanographic factors as the outer, outer coast is. Um, so within the Salish Sea, we have 73 species that are highly dependent seasonally or year round um, on, uh, on, these, on the waters of the Salish Sea. On the outer coast, there's at least 50 species many of which only use those waters seasonally. Um, so we do get a lot of species that move from out of our region and take advantage of what's typically very productive waters in the spring, summer, and early fall before conditions deteriorate on the outer coast. And then they, they clear out and move into, whether that's back down south um, to the Southern hemisphere or down south into more temperate parts of the California current. 
within all those species, we have two species um, that are state or fed and or federally listed. And both of these feature in, in, um, in this talk, the marbled merlet and the tufted puffin. And I'll be talking about those in detail in a little bit. I also wanted to uh, just give you a sense of the diversity and the, the different families of seabirds and how many species we have in them, what their conservation status is. So I compiled this table. So the left column here is the family. So we have these five different families. We have storm petrels, we have petrels and shearwaters. They're in the same order. These are all what are called tube noses or prosoluria forms. We have a third family, the alcids. We have cormorants, and then we have gulls and terns. So we have two storm petrel species that breed. Other species can come into our, our waters, but two that breed in our waters. Uh, the leeches storm petrel and the fork-tailed storm petrel. The leeches storm petrel is a species of conservation concern. That's why I put it in orange here. So this is the category of vulnerable or endangered species. It's not federally or state listed as such, but it is a state listed species of conservation concern. Um, petrels and shearwaters, we actually don't have any documented breeding by petrels and shearwaters, but this is this, this comment that I'm about to make points to, um, I think, um, one of my central points that I hope you'll lead with, which is that despite the fact that we live in a region that has research agencies, um, state and federal agent, wildlife agencies, universities, nonprofits, that we know remarkably little about the status and trends of many seabird species that use our waters. Um, so there's a one question mark here because the Manx shearwater, so this is just the four letter acronym for Manx shearwater. Manx shearwaters are only described breeding in the Atlantic Ocean, primarily in the North Atlantic. But we have been seeing Manx shearwaters every year on the outer coast of Washington. So this is a species that's also highly migratory. In the Northern, North Atlantic winter, they move into the South Atlantic. So presumably what happened is Manx shearwaters got down to the Southern Atlantic and then simply went up the wrong side of South America. So instead of going back up the Atlantic side, whether they got blown across in a storm, you know, around Cape Horn, they wound up going, they wound up, going up the Pacific side. And there, that migratory imperative said, go North. So they went North and they got up here and they're like, huh, the coast is not in the right place. This doesn't look familiar. But what we don't know is if they breed here or not. Um, so that's something that we're actually trying to figure out, um, which can be hard if it's a very small population that is burrow breeding. They, be, they visit their burrows at night. Um, and you've seen some of the pictures of the islands on the outer coast. They could well be out there and it's very difficult to determine um, if, if they're there and if so, where. Um, the alcids, um, that includes puffins, merlets, auklets. So this is a group here. We have six confirmed species and then another species that we suspect is breeding on the outer coast, but we don't have definitive proof yet. Um, we have three species of cormorants, pelagics, brants, and double crested's. Um, none of those are in the state of conservation concern. Gulls and terns, um, gulls breed, um, they, they hybridize all over the place. It's a mess. Um, there are multiple species. Um, we do know that there are glaucous wing gulls. There are glaucous wing western gull hybrids. We are there. I'm sure there are some other hybrids in there that just look distressingly like everything else. Um, and then we have Caspian terns that also breed in our in our region. So if we kind of look at this collectively, there's eight species of conservation concern, which is a conservation category below kind of that formal listing of threatened or endangered. And again, just to return to this point, which is both a challenge and an, opportun an exciting opportunity, is that for many of species, um, even species as iconic as, a, as the tufted puffin, 
um, the status and population trends aren't well understood. So transitioning then to um, some of the species that we're focusing on in, in our work, uh, the tufted puffin, which is um, a candidate at the federal level under the Endangered Species Act, I mean, we're involved in that petition. If five, I guess it's six years ago now, it was state listed as endangered. Um, so this is a species that we've been devoting a lot of effort to over the last several years. And I'll come back to some of that work in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but we're, we're involved in crafting the status report for the tufted puffin on which the status decision to list as endangered was based. And then more recently, in 2019, the recovery plan and periodic status review was published. So these are published at the state level by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And my colleagues and I um, were involved in crafting these documents that are helping to drive the conservation strategy and planning for this species. Uh, we also work on the rhinoceros auklet um, shown here. This is a species that's considered of least concern. It's actually doing really well in Washington waters. So it provides a really interesting comparison and contrast because it co-occurs on many of the same islands as tufted puffins. It's a diving alcid. In fact, as I mentioned before, it's functionally a puffin. It's thriving. Tufted puffins are declining worryingly. Um, and so we can, tr we can try to discern what's driving the puffin declines by in part comparing what they're doing differently to what rhinos or rhinoceros aquats are doing. Uh, Leech's storm petrel, it's just an elegant bird, just absolutely beautiful. This, um, the weight of a robin, um, tiny bird like this that spends um, its entire life at sea, except when it comes back to incubate its egg and provision its chick. Um, you know, to see these birds navigate in 60 mile an hour storms and huge seas, uh, is, is truly awe-inspiring. Um, Cassin's auklet, which is also in that alcid group or that group with puffins and merlets and auklets is near threatened. Um, and again, we just don't really have any sense of what's going on with Cassin auklet populations in our state. So I'm gonna transition now to talk a little bit about some of the approaches that we're using. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, working on these islands can be really challenging to get onto them. They can be very fragile. Um, we're certainly, we don't wanna cause impacts in any of the monitoring that we're doing. So we're using some pretty cool technology, including what's called bioacoustic monitoring. So what I, I show here is an acoustic recording unit. It's essentially a microphone that's attached to a digital recorder that's programmable. And it's in a weatherproof box. And so you can set these out on islands and they will capture ambient sound. And then you can you know, use computer algorithms and analytical approaches to process all of those hundreds or thousands of hours of audio recordings to pick up signals that recognize, oh, that's a storm petrel. And so it's not as though we have to listen to them manually, which is what was done Traditionally, um, a lot of this is now done, it's done, uh, it's automated. And that allows us to consider things like putting out five or six of these on an island and ask, is there evidence of species X on this island? Really remarkable uh, technology. And so what we can use this for or ask questions like, are there storm petrels nesting on islands on the outer coast of Washington? Storm petrels nest in burrows that have an entrance about this big. Um, so they're in, in frequently in dense vegetation on these islands, which may have thousands of burrows and on islands, again, that may be very fragile. And we're, re we're really concerned about crushing and collapsing burrows and damaging the breeding habitat. So an alternative to get a sense of, uh, is there evidence that they're even on these islands is to deploy these bioacoustic recording units. And here's how we can use this information. So this figure here um, is for both species of storm petrels, leeches and fork tail. The, the, what you'll see is a series of panels. So each of these panels corresponds to the location of a unit. So this 
top one is a unit on Destruction Island. So these top five are units that we put out on the outer coast of Washington on Destruction Island. Um, so they're separated, so they're capturing different soundscapes on that island. And what you're looking for is mean calls per minute. So this panel is saying, well, over you know, five or four months, there basically was no evidence of storm petrels at this, at, on this, uh, at this area within this recording radius from the unit. Oh, there's a little bit of activity here. Doesn't mean they're breeding there, but it means that they were heard vocalizing in flight um, within the sensitivity of the device. So Destruction Island, at least where we put these, uh, these top five units, there may be a few birds breeding, but again, the evidence is, is not particularly definitive and it certainly doesn't suggest that there's a, a, a decent sized colony there. East Bedelta, which is farther to the north, it's between La Push and uh, Nia Bay or Cape Flattery. Um, East Bedelta, well, there's actually a little bit of activity, but just for a couple of weeks, really. If they're breeding there through this, if they're breeding there, then you'd expect to hear, you'd expect to get vocalizations throughout a lot of the season. We look at middle Bedelta and we say, aha, look at this. We're getting commonly five, 10, 15 calls per minute um, over multiple months. That suggests that they're breeding on that island. So that then can help us direct our efforts to say, okay, we wanna do something looking at monitoring storm petrels Middle Bedelt is a place where we might actually evaluate, assess the feasibility of doing a monitoring study. So we're also using that same approach for Manx shearwaters, that, that uh, shearwater that I mentioned before from the Atlantic. So in this photo here, this is a flock of sooty shearwaters on the outer coast, but these two birds in the foreground are not sooty shearwaters. These are both Manx shearwaters that were just mixed in in this raft of sooties. We're seeing them again consistently on the outer coast, but it would take decades of, of work to try to go systematically island to island and kind of a logistically prohibitive exercise to figure out where they may be breeding. But we can use these same acoustic recording units to ask that same question. Is there, is there evidence of vocal activity on these islands? We're also using it for ancient merlets, um, which are not described. There's one historical record of an ancient merlet egg on the outer coast of Washington 95 years ago. Since then, they've not been described. Um, so we're trying to figure out, they, well, based on boat-based surveys that have seen young chicks at sea, it suggests that they are breeding in these waters, but we don't know where. So again, we've deployed these acoustic recording units and especially around the mid, the Bedeltas. So that's where we also saw evidence of Legion storm petrels. Um, so just to give you a, in this inset is map of Washington, again, or Western Washington in the peninsula. Here's uh, Cape Flattery. This box is the larger map. So we're part way down from Cape Flattery, the Bedeltas are just offshore, these little rock stacks. Middle Bedelta, we got these results, which you're probably not, you're gonna say, that looks like some pretty colors on a, on a figure. What is that telling me? This is a sonogram, and this is the information that the algorithms are processing. Um, so this is a digital or a graphical representation of the acoustic signal. So, Here's the frequency in kilohertz over time. I don't imagine many of you would know that this is actually an ancient Merlet call. If, if you do, I'm really impressed. Um, but this is um, a sonogram from the middle Bedeltas where we've gotten repeated signals like this, which says, tells us that there is, this is direct evidence that ancient Merlets are actually on middle of the Delta. So again, it directs our efforts to say, hmm, maybe that's where we want to put in some effort to see if they're actually breeding there. Being on the ground is suggestive, but it's not definitive proof. 
Um, so <clears throat> some of the other islands that we're working on, um, Alexander Island, which is south of La Push, north of uh, Destruction Island. This again is part of the National Wildlife Refuge Complex. A few of my colleagues here on Alexander, this is my colleague, Scott Pearson. He's a senior research scientist with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. One of my research students who just graduated a year or two ago, did some great work on tufted puffins, part of our team. Tom Good from NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Sue Thomas is a biologist with the refuge. And then Chad is um, boat captain extraordinaire and biologist who um, works for Scott um, for the state of Washington. Um, this is beautiful habitat on Alexander. There are no introduced mammals. You have, you have these bunch grasses, native bunch grasses. They um, produce really dense root systems. The soil is well consolidated. You don't see a lot of erosion. Um, you see burrow entrances you know, right in this foreground here. There's five burrow entrances. Um, probably rhinoceros auklets. There might be some storm petrels in here, maybe some cassins auklets. This is what many of the islands look like. And, um, and islands like Destruction Island should look like um, if it weren't for other impacts. Um, so this is a view across, um, just for scale. There's one of my colleagues sitting on the ridge. This is looking south um, from Alexander. On the horizon back here is Destruction Island. And Destruction Island is located right off Ruby Beach um, in uh, 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 Olympic National Park. So here's Destruction Island. Um, it has a fascinating history. It's got this cool lighthouse. It was administered by the Coast Guard for a number of years. It's had different managers over the years. It's, it's just been transferred back to the Coast Guard from Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we study, we've been working out here since 2008 on rhinoceros auklets. Uh, there are also colonies of Brant's cormorants shown here. Pigeon guillemots. So if you're like, oh, what was that pigeon guillemot that Peter's talking about? Th these are pigeon guillemots. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them around. They're common in Gig Harbor. They're common in intro waters throughout Puget Sound and uh, uh, along the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the outer coast. Beautiful birds, uh, fascinating uh, seabirds. And now to talk a little bit about tufted puffins. Stina, when we were talking about kind of what, what I should focus, she's like, well, when you talked about puffins, you got to talk about puffins some more. So I'm going to talk about puffins some more because they are, a, again, they're an iconic species. Everybody knows what a puffin is, whether it's a tufted puffin or an Atlantic puffin or a horned puffin. Um, and yet, despite the fact that they really are iconic, we, re we know so little about them in the lower 48. They've been relatively well studied up in Alaska, but populations are smaller um, down here in Washington, Oregon, California, even up into British Columbia. And um, we just, we really don't re know particularly well a lot of the aspects of their ecology. Um, what we do know is actually quite worrying about the conservation status. So I wanna frame that a little bit. Why are we concerned about tufted puffins? Well, their colonies have declined over time. So we do have some historic data going back to the early 1900s and even late 1800s. Um, so my colleague Scott and I compiled all of the historical records that we could find um, from papers, from books, from descriptions, where tufted puffins were confirmed breeding historically and, and over different time periods. So to, to give you a sense, so these are colonies. So this, this represents an island. Um, so in the early 1900s, to the best of our knowledge, there were 43 different islands with active colonies. Those colonies could have been as small as a, a 10 to 20 pairs, up to possibly as many as 10,000 birds. Um, by the late 70s, early 80s, we'd lost a few, which is never a good thing, but we were still doing reasonably well. We lost eight over you know, a period of 75, 80 years. Not great, certainly a cause for concern, but not alarming. When we did, when we redid surveys um, 
in the 20 in 2007 to 2014 time period we were down to 19 active island colonies greater than half of the colonies in Washington state had disappeared many of them in the preceding 30 years so something in the last three decades or so caused a precipitous decline, not just in the numbers, but in the actual occupancy of colonies. Like entire colonies are just, they're gone. They don't exist. There are no puffins around them. Um, where did that occur? Well, throughout Washington water. So on the right here, I have panels. This is actually from the 2015 status report. So here's the outer coast of Washington in three panels that correspond to these time periods, the early 1900s to mid 1900s, 1978 to 1984, 2007 to 2014. So each dot represents a colony and then the color and size correspond to a size class of the colony. So red are small colonies, green are intermediate, that orangish color is you know, medium large, purple large. We had two large colonies on the outer coast up until the mid 70s. That dropped to one in the late 70s, early 80s. That colony um, is, is still present, but we don't have any colonies. If you look at the colors here, we don't have any colonies that are more than a few hundred birds um, on the outer coast. It's bleaker in some respects in the Salish Sea. So here's what we know about historically. What's important to recognize here is that we never had colonies of the size that we uh, know existed on the outer coast. The largest colonies that we know of were Protection Island, Smith Island, um, and then um, up here on, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the island in the Northern San Juans. Today, the only two islands in the entire Salish Sea that retain breeding puffins are Smith Island and Protection Island. And Protection Island has gone from estimates of several hundred pairs down to right now, we think there may be as few as five pairs breeding on the island. So we've lost colonies as well as colony size. So prior to 1978, there were nine that we know of with at least 1,000 individuals and two with at least 10,000 individuals. Today, or you know, as of seven years ago, and you know, our most recent data don't point to any different trend, there are none that have 1,000 individuals and only three with 100 to 200 estimated individual puffins. So really alarming declines. Um, annual rate of decline, and this is a very approximate estimate, but even if it's a, a percent or two or three off, that rate of decline, no seabird species can sustain that rate of decline without a trajectory towards extinction in the not too distant future. Um, our and again, these numbers, take them with a, a large grain of salt, in fact, probably a chunk of salt, um, but to give you a sense of you know, what we're looking at in terms of numbers, we think there were probably about 25,000 birds 100 or so years ago on the um, outer coast. That dropped by maybe 10% maybe or so by the late 70s, early 80s, but it's you know, a, nearly a 90% decline um, most recently from what we know or, or, or you know, our best guess of historical population size. We're seeing this on a regional scale too, which is even more worrying. So if we think about the entire California current system, which extends from Southern California, Northern Baja California, all the way up into Southern BC, that's that California current upwelling system. It's not just Washington, Oregon, 90 plus percent, California, 90 plus uh, percent decline. So whatever is affecting them here is affecting them range wide throughout the California current system. Whether the drivers of those declines are all the same is something that we're still trying to wrestle with. So on Destruction Island, which is uh, the island that we have our longest term data set from, 
this is really the colony. Um, this is where uh, 18 of the 20 known um, breeding pairs nest on this slope and just behind the slope here. Um, if you, if, depending on the resolution of your image, you might be able to see a few stakes here that mark burrows um, and also trail cameras. Um, but we observe from rocks across this little cut. There's a former student of mine, Robin, sitting and doing observations of puffins on that slope. And we do a variety of things. Most of it's non-invasive. Puffins are very sensitive to disturbance. And the last thing that we want is our presence to have an impact on their breeding success. But we do things like look at burrow visitation rates. We look at provisioning rates when they've got offspring. We uh, use camera probes, infrared cameras to determine the fate of burrows. How many of these burrows actually successfully fledge offspring? Um, we're not handling any of these birds again, to minimize disturbance. How many birds are associated with the colonies, you know, on the surface, on the water offshore of the colony? Um, so colony activity patterns, that gives us also another metric into population trends over time. What we've seen around Destruction Island over the last seven or so years is the evidence suggests over that short time period, which again, for a seabird, seven years is not a particularly long period of time, that the population appears to be stable for now. But seven years again for seabird is, is not a particularly consequential amount of time. Um, we'll use trail cameras. So this is another piece of cool technology that we get to play with. So these trail cameras you can see here on a stake and it looks like this puffin is posing uh, regally for it, allows us to capture activity at the colony, including things like birds arriving to provision, arriving at a burrow, like the burrow right behind this stake here marks this burrow behind the puffin. That's a, a breeding burrow from for a tufted puffin. And we can use those photos to help us collect additional data about the frequency with which they're provisioning their chicks. Um, sometimes we'll get images that we can actually use to identify prey. And that leads to another key aspect of the work that we're trying to do. We, we suspect strongly that one of the drivers of the decline in the region is changes in prey availability and abundance. But we lack historical data. We don't have good data on what they've eaten historically. Um, a student of mine and I have used museum specimens to try to, uh, to, to use a, an, a, an approach called stable isotope analyses. It gives us some insights into historical diet, but it's not the same as describing you know, what's in a bill load. So we are looking at bill loads and a lot of this is done photographically. So we sit um, and it's always beautiful and blue clear skies on the outer coast of Washington, just like this. There's never rain, there's never fog, never any wind. Um, but what we'll do is we'll sit there with our digital SLRs with zoom lenses and take photos like this. And sometimes we can zoom in enough that we can count so we're basically interested in what they're bringing back to their chicks. So with a photo like this, we can actually generate multiple types of information. How many fish are in the bill? Is it all fish? Are there squid? Are there, uh, are there krill or cr other crustaceans? We can, um, if it's a good photo like this, we can actually identify it to species. Um, and using the bill as a proxy for a ruler, we can actually approximate the size class of the fish. And so we're, it, we're generating a database now of multiple years that's telling us what are they eating, how big are the fish, how many are they bringing back at a time, so we can compare between years to see how variable their diet is. And that's information that we can, we collect similar data for rhinoceros auklets. But with rhinoceros auklets, we actually get the bill loads themselves. And so we can measure the fish, um, weigh them and all of that, but we can ask questions and compare and contrast between these two puffins. And so we, to you know, borrow from, Jay, uh, from uh, Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Puffins, uh, the tufted puffin and the rhinoceros auklet. And what we see when we compare the two of them using just a few metrics, we see contrasting trends. Um, a couple of which I've alluded to previously, but I'm sum summarizing them here. So 
Rhinoceros auklets, both in the Salish Sea, which is interesting given how disturbed the Salish Sea is. It's a heavily impacted body of water. Our evidence based on historical data indicate that rhinoceros auklets are actually more abundant now in the Salish Sea than they, see, than they were in the 1970s. Um, they're really thriving and they seem to be doing perfectly well on the outer coast of Washington. So our conclusion is at present that the evidence is consistent with the idea that Washington statewide, their populations have increased. I've already shown you the data that we have that uh, you know, demonstrate the precipitous decline in um, population size for tufted puffins. What's going on? You know, these are species that, again, they occur on the same islands. They're both deep diving seabirds. They both eat primarily fish. In fact, there's a fair bit of dietary overlap. Why? So it can't be all diet or else you couldn't reconcile the fact that these populations are exhibiting contrasting trends. Um, when we look at reproductive success, and again, we don't have historical data for puffins, we do for rhinoceros auklets from the 1970s, they actually seem to be breeding more successfully now, slightly, but enough that it's consistent with the idea that what we are inferring is a real population size increase is supported by the fact that their breeding success is also higher. And we're presuming based on the, the big population declines that reproductive success in tufted puffins has decreased. With diet, we have no evidence based on a couple of different approaches that the diet of rhinoceros auklets has changed. Um, both direct comparisons with diet collected in the 1970s, as well as this indirect uh, stable isotope approach. And if anybody wants to hear Anybody wants to geek out on the science of stable isotopes, I can, I'm happy to explain that in the question and answer. But it's essentially a way to think about trophic level or where they're feeding in the food chain. It's not as precise as looking at what's precisely in the bill load, um, like in this photo of this rhinoceros auklet. Um, so the challenge then is to figure out what is really driving these declines. Um, and the declines that we see in tufted puffins are mirrored by several other species of seabirds, including marbled merlets. So it's not just that tufted puffins are struggling in Washington waters, other species are as well. So what are those threats? And the threats that I'm about to share with you um, are not unique to our waters. These are threats that seabirds confront almost globally. Um, in some combination. And not all of these threats apply equally to all seabirds. Some of them may impact some species and not others, whereas some species may be vulnerable to some degree to all of these threats that I'm about to just walk through quickly. So declining prey availability. You know, we do know that forage fish have declined, especially in the Salish Sea. Um, so, you know, things like herring, Pacific herring in the Salish Sea, the declines in, the, in herring stocks have, are well documented. Uh, recovery of avian predators. And this is both a success story to celebrate and an interesting conservation conundrum. 50 years ago, we had, functionally, we had no avian predators on, in coastal Washington. We essentially had no bald eagles, Peregrine falcons have largely disappeared. Um, they have recovered spectacularly. They're arguably some of the greatest conservation success, species level success stories we've had in our country. Um, but what's happened is, especially in the case of bald eagles, they're recovering. So their populations have rebounded spectacularly, but they've recovered into a system that's very different than the, in, in many respects than the system that they, dis that they largely disappeared from 50, 70, 80, 100 years ago. We think about changes in forage fish availability. We think about the collapse of a lot of salmon stocks. Um, these, were key these were key food groups for bald eagles. Bald eagles are really flexible predators. They're very opportunistic. And so a lot of eagles now are preying 
preying on seabirds, you know, adults, chicks, eggs. So what do you do when species of conservation concern are harassed by species who, who were of conservation concern, but have only just now recovered back into the ecosystem? It gets really complicated to try to figure out how do you, how do you address things like that? Contaminants and pollution. And this is both at the acute level. So we can think about oil spills and releases of sewage and things like that. We can also think about it as chronic. So these stable pollutants that, and contaminants that accumulate and persist in our bodies of water and then can actually bioaccumulate or move up the food chain um, from lower trophic levels to higher trophic level predators. Fisheries bycatch. Um, this is certainly something that's being addressed, although it's not fully resolved. Um, we do lose seabirds, marine mammals, non-target fish species in different fisheries. Um, and historically, that was an even greater impact than it is today. Um, today, there are a lot of effective mitigation me measures that have reduced bycatch significantly. Shoreline armoring, which is an interesting one because it's not directly influencing the birds, but shoreline armoring, as a lot of you may know, interrupts the flow of sediment and nutrients from the near shore, or the, the um, sorry, the super littoral zone into inshore waters. So it can kind of starve those waters of sediments and nutrients. That changes the dynamics of those inshore communities, which are really important for a lot of forage fish, as well as other really cool uh, marine uh, species. But that then is, again, influencing the prey, which ultimately, have, ultimately has consequences for the birds themselves. Introduced species. Um, this is one that there are marine species, uh, introduced species of conservation uh, uh, that can have conservation impacts. But um, we can also think about them on the islands themselves. So things like European rabbits, which are on destruction island on the outer coast. They're on a number of San Juan Islands. Um, they alter plant communities. They burrow, they compete, they enhance um, erosion rates. Those sorts of things can be very problematic for breeding seabirds, as well as introduced plant species that may alter that breeding habitat of, of seabirds on islands. Disturbance, um, in many, for many seabirds in Washington, because they breed on these federally protected islands that are closed access, Disturbance at the breeding colonies is typically pretty low, um, but it can exist. Um, but at sea, it can be problematic if you have a lot of boat traffic, whether that's commercial or recreational, um, industrial. If, though, if there's a lot of boat traffic through areas that are important feeding areas or roosting areas or resting areas for seabirds, um, those can have costs to seabirds. Harmful algal blooms, climate change, and ocean acidification, which those three are all kind of intertwined, you know, and, and, and associated with one another. Those are big issues, obviously, and, and are not um, things that are easily tractable, things that we can necessarily move the needle on meaningfully in short periods of time. Some of these others are. So although I have this, uh, you know, this obsession with seabirds, I also, recognize that the seabirds really can only thrive when the system itself is thriving. And when we think about marine systems in our region, um, and this is true in many parts of the world, forage fish are, are a key, like they really are the nexus. You know, what happens above and below is largely driven and regulated and managed by what's happening in the middle. And I really love this figure by the Pew Environment Group. We have forage fish in the middle here. So this is essentially looking at the trophic level from the bottom here to upper trophic level towards the surface. So you can think about energy flow. It's not perfectly linear, but it's moving in this direction. So down in the bottom here, you have your producers, you have your phytoplankton, primary consumers, zooplankton and things like that, which are consumed by small fish. Forage fish then are preying on those kind of planktonic organisms. And then forage fish form the base of, you can think about as the mid to upper trophic level food web. 
where you have higher trophic level fish, um, including salmon, uh, marine mammals, uh, such as sea lions and, um, and harbor seals, orcas, baleen whales, um, and seabirds. They are all dependent on what's happening below them. And so recognizing this ecological connectivity is really important. Seabirds, their fate is intertwined with the fate of everything else that's going on around them. And to put that into a little bit of context, I, I include this figure, which shows two very simplified food webs for our region. Um, this is, these were created for Puget Sound. So on the left is a, a historical food web with some large categories. Um, and then on the right is present day. And I'm just going to start with forage fish. So if you can see this on, on your screens, the, the bolder categories are ones that were considered to be drivers or disproportionately important groups in that food web at that time. And historically, we're talking about 40, 50 years ago, not necessarily even hundreds of years ago. So if we look at forage fish, they're bolded big influence. Rockfish, salmon, seabirds all depend on them. They're all bolded. Um, historically, they were all a lot more abundant in our region than they are today. Um, we look down in the bottom, we have ratfish, dungeness crabs, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and invertebrates, killer whales. This isn't to say killer whales were not important in the system, but in terms of how they influenced the system, they historically were never thought to be at the level of influence of like the salmon populations that we've had historically. Present day, you can see forage fish where they're there, but they're in greatly reduced numbers, which has consequences for everything that depends on them. So seabird numbers have declined, salmon numbers have declined, rockfish numbers have declined, killer whale numbers, we all know that story. Um, and part of that story is driven by food availability. What's changed? Well, jellies are a lot more abundant. Dungeness crabs are more abundant. Ratfish are more abundant. So there's been a shift in the structure of, of these food webs that has implications for things like seabirds. So normally I conclude there, but what I wanted to do was bring in, like now that I've talked about, I've talked a little bit about seabird natural history, some of the, the work that is being done by our group in, in the region, I really wanted to finish um, by grounding it in some local opportunities and some, some stuff that I'm particularly excited about. So transitioning to marbled merlets in the South Sound, I'll try, I'm, I'm cognizant of time, I'll try to keep this concise. Stina, you can rein me in if you're like, Peter, this is great, but. <laughs> um, the nice thing about this, Peter, is we really yeah. have all the time that you have. So if you want to go over some, you're, you're welcome to tell us the good word of marble from your left. So okay, no, I will, no time I, constraints I will. in the digital world. Okay. <laughs> Less time. I, I'm not time constrained either. So um, <laughs> I just don't want to um, impose on people's um, kindness and, and, and willingness to listen. But so marble merlets, uh, just to kind of bring them back into the conversation from a conservation perspective, are both federally and state listed. Um, here's pictures of them on the water. Beautiful little seabirds. Um, they're kind of crazy seabirds. Their natural history is amazing. So most sensible seabirds um, breed on the coast. You know, there's like, I live on the ocean, I make my living on the ocean, I'm safe from a lot of predators and so forth in the ocean. I come to land begrudgingly because I need to. And when I come to land, I want it to be an island or a protected headland or something right on the coast. Marbled merlets, which are about that they're a little bit smaller than pigeon guillemots, have completely turned that, that paradigm on its head. So in this, this I love this illustration um, by Laurel Mundy. Um, so they're, they're in alcids, or they're in the same family as puffins and so forth. They're a diving seabird. You can see here's their winter plumage, um, a pursuit, pursuit diving seabird, they're wing propelled, which none of that is remarkable. That's kind of 
part and parcel of being an Alsin, you know, in that Puffin, Mer, Merlet family. The crazy part is their breeding. So these birds have said, yeah, I see those islands. I see those coastal forests. That's not for us. We're going to breed 10, 20, 30, 40 miles inland in old growth forest. And so that's what they do. And this is one of the reasons why it was so, there was so little known about them until 20 or 25 years ago, because they nest generally, well, in, at least in mature growth, mature growth, old growth forest on way up in the canopy on branches that are large enough for them to have a simple nest. So they lay their egg essentially in epiphytes on a large branch way up in the canopy, 70, 80, couple of hundred feet up. And they come and go at night. It's like, can you come up with much more difficult scenario to try to figure out where in the world these birds breed? Um, but people have figured it out using a variety of techniques. So there's been a lot of advances made in the last 25 to 30 years in understanding a lot of aspects of their biology. Uh, including their diet, where they're breeding. But you can tell by the fact that they're the, from their dependence on these forests that one of the drivers of their decline is the fact that we've lost a, a tremendous amount of their prime breeding habitat throughout their range from Northern California all the way up into British Columbia and parts of Alaska. What is less well known, and so here in Washington state, there's a lot of great work that's been done by the US Forest Service, um, by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. In fact, my colleague, Scott Pearson, in his capacity as a senior research scientist, he oversees the state level work on marbled merlets, much of which uh, involves boat-based surveys throughout Washington waters. Um, but a few years ago, I'll just keep it here, but this is such a lovely illustration. A few years ago, now, I'm a really keen sea kayaker and I paddle on the, the waters in a, of our region a ton. Um, I started seeing, or I started noticing marbled merlets in a few spots pretty consistently um, through the summer months, like during the breeding season. Um, and, you know, I'm a science nerd, so I would record it. And, you know, and I started to see this pattern and I, but, you know, I wonder, I wonder if they're actually use how they're using the south sound because they're not described it's not that they are never seen down here but they're not really described as using south sound waters historically probably quite a lot but we've lost so much forest down in the south sound region so anyway that led me to just say why don't we start to look for them in a more systematic way and with my undergraduate students here at University of Puget Sound, we've started to do that. And what we're finding, so this is a map of our immediate area. Um, and what we're, start, what we're finding is evidence that they are using during the breeding season. So not at this time of year, but beginning in about April through late July, early August with the limited data that we have so far, three areas pretty consistently. Um, the area between Bash Point and Browns Point Lighthouse, including the waters immediately around Browns Point Lighthouse, um, off Point Fosdick and up towards the bridge, but not all the way up to the bridge. And then um, saving the best for last because of where Harbor Wild Watch is based, um, right off of Gig Harbor, the mouth of Gig Harbor, we don't know as much about, we haven't invested as much survey effort into these two areas, but during the summer months, it was consistent. We were seeing two to six or eight marble merlets in breeding plumage. Here we were consistently seeing two to eight or 10 marble merlets. Um, so what we're beginning to do is characterize um, those areas. Um, of, and most of the work, last summer, I had a student working out of Browns Point Lighthouse um, and those waters. So he was mapping where they were spatially, um, doing surveys of numbers, looking at interactions with boats, 
um, and starting to characterize their foraging. So how were they using that space? Was it just that they were hanging out on the water? Were they diving, which means that they were foraging? And in all three locations, we found them foraging. Um, so it suggests that they're using these areas fairly consistently. And they might, we might think of them if, if this year's data um, support what we've found thus far as hotspots or locally important areas for marble merlets. There may be additional areas, and down in the, lo the lower part of the map here include um, Chambers Creek. There are, uh, there's some information out there that suggests that they might be using the inshore waters around um, Chambers Creek as well. So we're going to, I'm going to have a student this summer repeat some of these surveys and begin to characterize that. And then what we're trying to do is associate, we want to understand why. You know, what is it about those waters? Well, it's pr presumably because they're prey there, um, but why are the prey there? Well, what sort of oceanographic characteristics are there? Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that we want to unpack to better understand the degree to which these are important. When I went to, to the Department of Fish and Wildlife with this information, and they do surveys through here, but their surveys, um, and this is, this is how they have to do the surveys because they're covering large areas. They, can't, they don't have the luxury of having somebody doing a survey four or five days a week. They go through once or twice a season in the boat and they're doing a moving transect. So when I, when I com communicated this to Scott Pearson, he's like, oh my gosh, you know, we, don't, we actually don't have records of this. This is really interesting because what this suggests is these birds tend to forage not that far from where they go inland to breed. We don't know if these birds are breeding. There were just one or two marbled merlets, we'd say, we'd probably say they're just kind of geographically embarrassed. They, they're lost, you know, they're not doing anything. But the fact that there are multiple hotspots, at least again, tentatively speaking, and that we're seeing, you know, up to probably 20 or so birds across those hotspots means that maybe some of them are breeding. And that's not been described in this region. So it does, it's suggestive of the possibility that there may be a small breeding population still in remnant forest in our South Sound area, which definitely has important conservation implications for the species in our, in our state. So what I wanted to mention that because I think uh, and Steen and I haven't had a chance to talk about this in any meaningful way, but I think that there are some exciting possibilities, and this I would love to open up for a discussion if, we, if folks have the time and the energy um, to see, to explore ways where we might leverage the interest of people, local folks, to develop some sort of a community science program focused on making observations of marbled merlets at some of these locations. Uh, I think it could be a really cool way. These birds are inshore, so you can see them with binoculars. Um, there's a lot we could do over the few months that would actually really help us collect data on a scale that we can't do um, just you know, with a few of us, you know, myself with a, a couple of uh, research students here at the university. So, I hope that's got you excited about, you know, thinking about, wow, that's kind of cool. I could, I wouldn't mind going out there and hanging out and doing some counts of marble merlets or what might that look like? Um, it's a very embryonic idea, but I would really, I'd love to explore that uh, and see if there's kind of energy towards maybe developing something. Um, the comments are going wild. I think you've... Uh... <laughs> Excellent. Yay. That's, ex that's awesome. Um, so really quickly, then just to wrap up, um, I know that there's, you know, these sorts of talks, it's always a, there's always a tension that exists, you know, for me as a conservation biologist, because I feel obligated to communicate what I think is kind of what's going on. You, you know, I don't want to be Pollyanna about the situation, but I don't want it to be paralyzing. I don't want people to feel fatalistic and say, well, we're screwed, you know, why bother? It, it, um, it, it's not going to make a difference. Um, 
I wouldn't do the work that I do if I if I didn't think we could be making a difference. And so I I do like to talk a little bit about where to from here. Um, well, we certainly, in terms of our team and a bunch of our colleagues, you know, we're going to continue to use applied research and monitoring so that we can better assess trends. How are species doing? How are different species of do, uh, do of seabirds doing? Better understand the relative importance of threats. You know. We kind of have a long, we have that laundry list of threats and we could say, well, we're just gonna tackle this one. But if it's not really informed by understanding what's going on with that particular species or on that particular island, all of you know, our efforts may not well be well-directed. So really trying to understand what's driving, what's having the greatest impacts on these, on these multiple species. Um, that's also informed by breeding season monitoring, better understanding marine habitat use, like. Ta -da! <laughs> uh, marble merlets here in, in South Sound. Who would have thought that we might have a, a locally important site off Browns Point, um, you know, for marble merlets or right off Cape Harbor? Thankfully, you know, in terms of the breeding colonies for most of these species, those crazy marble merlets notwithstanding, you know, they are already protected under some of the strictest standards of protection that we offer in this country under as a national wildlife refuge. That's wonderful. It means that many issues that could confront seabirds on the breeding colonies are not issues here in Washington. Um, we are looking at doing habitat restoration on islands um, to improve breeding habitat for seabirds, as well as generally help recover islands that have been impacted by human, um, human activities. Um, this one again, even though you know I am carrying the mantle or the 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 banner for seabirds, it comes back to forage fish populations. Forage fish are also starting to gain traction in the state legislature. So do keep an eye. Like arguably, if you want to make if you want to make a contribution to seabirds, argue for things, write letters, contact um, your representatives, and so forth about what's going on with forage fish. Um, and then in terms of my own, you know, my own experience um, working locally here in Washington, but I also have the opportunity to, uh, I've worked down in South America for over 20 years now. And the work that it's all grounded in community because if we want to affect long-term conservation change, it requires community engagement. It requires community buy-in and support. Um, so looking at this as partnerships um, and not as top-down, but engaging with communities and saying, let's do this together. Look at what we can do you know, when, we, when we work collaboratively um, towards advancing conservation. Um, so that's the last point that I wanted to make um, and just transition to, to a, a thank you slide. I appreci really appreciate um, the attention, uh, your attention, and um, I'm happy to try to address questions, comments. Awesome. Well, a huge round of applause to you, Peter. Not only are you so knowledgeable about seabirds, but you're also so inspiring. And I feel so lucky that we get to kick off our cocktails and fishtail season with this talk because that was fabulous. Um, so thank you so much. There are quite a few good questions in the comments. So I'm going to look over here and read yes. out a couple to uh, get them your way. Uh, okay. So. And uh, shall I keep <laughs> screen sharing? Um, you could screen share. Um, maybe let's stop screen sharing. So it's a little okay. more uh, back and forth. That sounds great. Um, but yes, lots of thumbs ups coming through. There we go. <laughs> that here. Uh, we'll start with Jesse Keating tuning in from Port Townsend tonight is wondering how... <laughs> Hi, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I, I know Jesse, but our, our kids went to the same um, elementary school. So. Oh, I love that. Jesse <laughs> and Eamon and Finn are we're big fans of those kiddos. And uh, cheers to Eamon for doing our Blue Water Task Force lab sampling. He's rocking and rolling with that so making sure there's no poo in the water those marbled mulets are swimming in oh, that's right <laughs> um all right so jesse's wondering how do you arrive at historical estimates of population sizes in reference to the tufted puffin 
um, population declines that I think we we took a chunk of salt with. But uh, yes, yeah. yeah it's, numbers. <laughs> oh, now you're gonna you're asking me to really expose just how how crude that <laughs> estimate is. Um, so there really are not particularly good quantitative estimates. Um, and so many of the estimates were, and part of it was that, again, these islands are difficult to access. Even before they were refuge islands, you know, it's, it's hard to get up on these islands. Um, so you need ideal ocean conditions. You know, you need to be a mountaineer practically for many of them uh, and so forth. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the, the data were naturalists and ecologists that were out there doing really hard work going up there and saying, right, we're on this island. We have 45 minutes, like spread out and count stuff. And, and people would say like, I think I had, there were like 20 burrows and I think they look like tufted puffins over here. And, and so, you know, that I would say that that is arguably the crudest as population estimate that I've ever worked with. Um, but there are numbers associated with the islands. Some of the islands were counted more carefully because they were a little bit more accessible, um, especially in the 70s and early 80s when a lot of data from the Washington, uh, the Washington Seabird Colony catalog, uh, when those data were compiled. Um, but the data are highly variable depending on the island, who visited, how long they had on the island, um, so, Jesse, I'm I'm bearing my soul. This is, <laughs> um, they really are meant to be a, a, approximations. And I think to us, whether it's 25,000 or 28,000 or 21,000, when we're talking about nearly an order of magnitude decrease um, from what our best historical estimate is to what our, our best estimate today, you know, 80, 90% decline, even if we say, let's be really conservative and say 75% decline, any population that has declined that precipitously over that period of time is from a biological perspective of critical concern. I think there was in the looking at, you know, the thought that in Washington state tufted puffins could be gone within my lifetime is like one of those like, whoa, uh, a little inspiring of some positive action there. Yeah, and, and that's and that's not to be alarmist. I mean, you know, what, they're they're salvageable. It, it, it's not a it's not a lost cause. Whether they persist in the Salish Sea, that I think is more tenuous because we've just got the two remaining populations and the stronghold in the Salish Sea is Smith Island, and you know, you it's always worrying when someone gives you an exact number for a population, that means there, there are few enough to count, you know, <laughs> that's never a good thing. And, you know, last summer we counted 25 active boroughs on Smith Island. Um, and, you know, and that's been 22, 25, you know, over the past two or three years. Um, and that's the stronghold. Um, so outer coast, I think there's, you know, unless we're able to move the needle in some way that we haven't figured out yet in, in the Salish Sea, um, I think we're we're less optimistic about the Salish Sea than the outer coast. But it's staggering how few people even know we have puffins in Washington. Yeah, cheers to those puffins. We do have a, a lot of folks uh, tuned in that I know, Julie. I love puffins, so. Yeah, it's like who doesn't? So it's like talk about an easy sell. My gosh, anybody who doesn't love puffins is heartless. Yeah, uh, I was personally wondering if maybe eagles like the taste of tufted puffins more than the rhinoceros auklets. Like, is that a? <laughs> well, yeah. So there, eagles eagles can have a couple of effects, and um, so there's the direct predation risk. So you know, the puffin in the burrow is safe. But the puffin on the surface or the puffin in flight is more vulnerable. So there's the direct predation, which can have an impact. But there's also the fear of predation. Um, and that's very real. And, it's, and we've actually started quantifying that a little bit. And it's, I mean, we've seen, we see this in the, you know, 
outer coast as well as in the Salish Sea, if there's an eagle in sight, tufted puffins are gone. They will bail off the colony, they won't come in, um, and they won't come in for quite some time after the eagle, even if the eagle has just eaten a five course meal and couldn't even consider a puffin. It's completely and utterly disinterested. They're so attuned that the presence of an, the visual presence of an eagle will ensure that there's no movement in the colony until the eagle is well and truly gone. Um, and on a place like Protection Island, where there are now dozens of eagles during the breeding season on a daily basis that are flying around, they're cruising, they're checking stuff out. Um, there may be not even, you know, there's so few puffins there that they're, it's, they're definitely not looking for puffins because they'd starve to death. Um, but just the fact that they're constant, you know, not, not constantly, but regularly soaring along the cliff edge, you know, that alone is enough to discourage puffins. Um, you know, if that's happened consistently over the course of the breeding season, that might cause, that alone could be enough to cause a breeding pair to fail. Wow. Yeah. And that, I think, is just, you know, uh, with conservation, it's like, you know, we've solved the DDT problem, or, you know, remove right. that, yay, eagles, but then just, you know, every yes. action has an impact. And uh, Right. What happens when my endangered species eats your, your endangered yeah. species? <laughs> Oh no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Julie Sawyer's tuning in and she's wondering, are ALSID numbers slash conservation numbers different if you compare Washington and Oregon or British Columbia? Um, followed up with, do tufted puffins do better in any particular place? I'm thinking of Alaska. <laughs> yeah, Alaska. So Alaska is where, so ALSIDs in general, you know, there's multiple species. So that's a, I didn't know, Julie, if you wanted to address multiple species or if it was focused more on the puffins, I can speak really quickly. Like marbled merlets, merlets have declined in California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, um, in part because those coastal zones have been heavily logged throughout a lot of that range. Um, and that's consistent throughout, you know, that part of their breeding range. Um, uh, other species like pigeon guillemots, they look like they're doing just fine throughout you know, much of their range, um, but they're, they're less specialized. You know, what happens, species that are specialists tend to be disproportionately vulnerable. Um, so whether that's a habitat specialist, like a, a marbled merlet, it depends on certain habit, breeding habitat, whether it's a dietary specialist. Um, when you get to things that are more generalist, like pigeon guillemots. Pigeon guillemots can nest in, in cavity burrows that they, that they excavate. They can nest in driftwood on the beach. They can nest in rocks. So they have kind of, they're pretty plastic in their breeding. And they feed in the inshore on a variety of different species. Inshore fish species have not been exploited like forage fish are. So pigeon guillemots, you know, there's no evidence that they're anything but stable throughout Kind of that, at least the California current region. They sound um, like a very sensible seabird uh, in your work. They are, you know, it's kind of, they just kind of roll with things like, yeah, I can nest here, I could do this, uh, whatever you got, I'll work with that. You know, they'll nest in pilings in old, you know, wharves and under, under, um, you know, platform, elevated platforms and ferry terminals. And um, so they're like, yeah, we can, we can work with that. You know, puffins, not a chance. Marble merlets, not a chance. With respect to tufted puffins particularly, um, so when we think about historically their district, all species have a natural range or a historic range or distribution. And typically, if you think about that range, it's not always symmetric, but just for simplicity's sake, we think about the core. The core is where the conditions are most favorable. And so that's where you tend to have the highest densities, the you know, largest populations, the populations that do best, um, because presumably that core is centered on at least historically where those conditions were most favorable for that species, best available habitat, best food resources, et cetera. As you move out, you can kind of think of concentric circles of 
progressively less suitable conditions. So the next range out, you're like, well, they're still there, they do fine, um, but they don't necessarily do quite as well as in the core. Then you go out again further, conditions are even more tenuous, a little bit less um, consistent maybe. And so as you move from the core out, those you get into areas where species have less and less buffer. They have less capacity to allow, to, to be successful if conditions change a little bit. So I, ex I, I explain that because the core of tufted puffin distribution is really up in Alaska. Um, the Aleutian Islands, Gulf of Alaska, um, historically. And then they move down the Western Pacific and the, you know, the Eastern Pacific, although we call ourselves the Pacific Northwest, we're in the Eastern Pacific. So you Eastern Pacific down, and we're really at the tail of what their historic distribution is in the California current, California, Oregon, and Washington. So if you were to expect the population to decline, it would likely decline at the edges of its range or distribution first. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it in the Western Pacific too. Um, in Japan, uh, numbers appear to be declining as well. I don't think as precipitously as here. So, you know, they just don't have as much buffer. The conditions here aren't as favorable generally, you know, in an average year as they are up in Alaska. Alaska, you're like, yeah, fishing, the fish supply isn't as great, but we've got all this other stuff. We've got these other fish species we can shift to. We can make it work. Down here, they don't have that buffer. Thanks. That's, a, I think, a really good way to visualize uh, that change. So well, just, just, yeah, hopefully that addressed your, your question, Julie. If not, please send the follow-up in. I think uh, mainly because she said, uh, thinking of the lower 48 um, on the West Coast, but. I think you touched on that. So okay, uh, yes, Julie, let us know if <laughs> you have some thoughts <laughs> on that. Uh, Ellie uh, is tuning in to wonder, uh, kind of in similar with the eagle puffin question. If you know, are the tufted puffins more conspicuous, and is there potential that the rhinoceros auklets um, and puffins are competing for like more of the nesting space? And maybe are are rhinoceros auklets kind of bullies like? Oh, well, not that we know of, but, <laughs> but uh, something that I didn't mention before, which is highly relevant. So thanks for that question, because it prompted me to, to mention this. So one important difference in terms of their natural histories, although, they, again, they're, they're co-occur, like they're on Protection Island together, they're on Smith Island together, they're on Alexandra, they're on Destruction, they're on Tatouche, etc., um, they are burrow nesters. Um, they use similar types of burrows. Tufted puffins are physically bigger birds. Um, we haven't seen aggressive interactions between them. Bigger doesn't always mean that they're more aggressive, um, but generally speaking, a bigger seabird is gonna displace a smaller one. Um, but an important difference is that rhinoceros auklets are active at the colonies at night. So they don't come in until nightfall. They, they exchange and or they deliver fish to their chick during, during the hours of darkness. And then they're out of the colony well before sunrise. In contrast, tufted puffins are active in the colonies during the day. So although we definitely see eagle predation on rhinoceros auklets, it's pretty light just because most of them are coming in when eagles are not particularly efficient at foraging. So eagles will forage at night, especially on full moon nights when it's bright. We see eagles in hunting mode on the islands, not to the degree they do during the day, but they're up there. So rhinos do need to be vigilant, but I think that the risk of predation is greatly reduced, which is why many seabirds, especially small seabirds, are active in the colonies at night for precisely that reason, um, aerial pre avian predators. Um, you know, you have to deal with owls at night, um, but you don't get large populations of owls on any of these islands. So 
um, the eagle disturbance is going to be and risk of predation to an individual bird from a population is much greater for tufted puffins. Uh, speaking of our, our nighttime bird friends, I guess, <laughs> kind of <laughs> segueing over to the marbled murelets, uh, definitely some folks interested in going out. And I see Eileen is popping in, uh, noticing that those hot spots of the marbled murelets noticed in our area are kind of triangulated around Point Defiance Park. Knowing that Eileen is also a hunter of monkey shines makes me wonder if like that bio um, acoustic idea. So we learned the call of the marbled murelet and instead of hunting for the uh, lunar new year treasures hidden throughout <laughs> the, the parks of <laughs> Tacoma, <laughs> do we go out, you know, listening for the call of the marbled murelet? Uh, and so she's wondering, uh, is that a possible breeding location or would they go further inland? Typically, I would never say never um, because that's the surest way for a seabird to, you know, humiliate you and they'll just, <laughs> you know, they'll just show you up. Um, typically, I'm unaware of them nesting that close to the coast in forest, even though the, they're right, that is, and that some of the trees in Point Defiance Park um, would support um, and some of the structure of that park is nearly old growth and they, it would support marble merlets. Um, but to my knowledge, at least, they, they haven't been recorded nesting nearly that close to the coast. You know, they are, they are truly in you know, 10, 15, 20 miles. Um, so that means, you know, they could be foraging here and they could be, they could be flying over and into Hood Canal and onto the eastern slopes of, you know, the Olympics. They could be flying up the Puyallup watershed and going up into some of the protected areas there. We have no idea. Um, one of the things that I would love to do, and I, this is something I'm like, yeah, this is something to get students on, is <laughs> um, is if we can if we can get uh, observations of direction of departure of marble merlets. So when they leave, and this would be done, uh, you know, presumably early evening. Um, so you're watching, just sitting there watching, and then you're keeping a particular eye on birds taking off and leaving. Which direction are they going? Um, it's not going to, it's not going to tell you, oh, they're going precisely there. But even something as crude as from, like, say we're out at the lighthouse at Gig Harbor on the spit, are they going in towards Commencement Bay? Are they going up Colvos Passage? Are they heading down, um, down the Narrows? Definitely. Even that crude information would, would indicate something. Totally. Um, something that we don't currently have, which is if they're here, we have absolutely no idea where they're breeding. I'm like, this sounds like some pretty bougie community science opportunities, like picnic in the park for sunset, watch the sunset and where yes. do the birds go? Like, I think we could uh, develop quite the program here, Peter. I, I think, I mean, there really are some cool opportunities though. So, so the, you know, the nice thing about Brown's, uh, Brown's Point is it's public access. It's a public okay. park and you can park there and all of that. A, a complexity of um, the the public space at the uh, on the Gig Harbor Spit is the access, you know. And I don't know. This was something that I've been trying to figure out. I may have, I may have some access. Um, I mean, it can be boat based, and you can get to Point Fosdick boat based as well, and deposit folks there. Um, but you'd have to get permission from the landowners, presumably that abut the base of the spit to be able to, and I don't know if, I don't know those people, I don't have any connections, you know, I don't know if there's any sort of precedent for that being done, but that just adds a little bit of a logistical uh, consideration into it. For, for at least that site. Um, <laughs> for those of you uh, tuned in now, if your people know the people that we need to know, <laughs> connect them with Peter. <laughs> um, you know, and then, and then Chambers Creek, if that turns out to be a site that, that is um, used fairly consistently, that's also publicly accessible. So, you know, we have two sites that 
don't require a boat that you can par, you know, drive and walk to easily, um, which is also an, you know, an equity and accessibility issue too. It's, it's accessible to you know, anybody who's interested really. Well, let there be some marbled murelet adventures, I think, in our near future. <laughs> it sounds great. Their, I have two, April, I've, April through August kind of time frame. Yeah. Um, and I've got students, I have two students who are applying for research grants this summer to do focused research on, on the species. Um, but again, just, you know, having, you know, I, I've already got ideas for possible protocols, you know, that, that are very user friendly. And for those of you that might be interested or even just considering, you're like, I, I don't know what a, you know, I don't know if I could recognize a, a marble merlet or what if there's so many birds and I, I can't pick them out. One of the things that simplifies it greatly is during the summer months um, in our area, the diversity of seabirds drops. Mm -hmm. um, we have very few seabird species um, in the area during the breeding season. And so the only thing that looks even remotely like a marbled merlet during the time that you're doing the, that we're doing these observations is a pigeon guillemot. Um, they're pretty easily distinguishable. So you don't need to be a hardcore birder um, to be able to actually participate in this, which I also think is really cool um, because it, it makes it again, more accessible, you know, with, with a quick little prep with a, a pamphlet with some representative photos, um, you know, like the student that I worked with last summer, he'd never seen a marbled merlet until last May. And he was completely fine all summer long and had never had any ID questions. Um, he's never taken my, you know, he's never taken my ornithology class. <laughs> um, you know, he was keen, but he was not an experienced uh, birder. He was not an uh, avian scientist or anything. Um, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> uh, let's see, we have a couple more questions and then um, I think we'll, we'll let everybody off the hook here. Uh, Julie is wondering if you know anything about the horned puffin that has shown up in the San Juan Islands. Is he lost? Is he a tourist? <laughs> is there any evidence of horned puffins in the Salish Sea? <laughs> Oh, and I have photos of that horned puffin. Okay. Um, um, yes, so we don't know if it's the same one. We're presuming it's the same one. So um, horned puffins, they're, they're, you know, if we think again about their distribution, um, they breed in Alaska. There's no known breeding south of Alaska. Uh, there's no evidence that they bred down here historically. But you know, seabirds, they're, they've got wings and even birds that are not particularly accomplished flyers like puffins, they can still cover big distances. Um, what we suspect is that this is a geographically embarrassed horned puffin. It's a good term. <laughs> um, that it, you know, it somehow got its wires crossed, it wound up down here, but there has been a, a horned puffin at Smith for at least three or four years, a single individual, it's not banded, so we can't tell, it doesn't have any really obvious identifying mark. We suspect it's the same bird for a number of reasons. One is that it's, even on the outer coast of Washington, it's really uncommon to see a, tough, a, a horned puffin. Um, but for different horned puffins, you know, in, in sequential years to come down the coast this far, find their way, you know, make the left turn as you're heading south to come into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and then wind up at Smith Island. I just, the odds of multiple birds doing that exact same thing are vanishingly small. So we suspect it's the same bird and it's, I suspect it's, you know, it's a lovelorn, you know, it's just waiting. It's like, where are my buddies? Like these, <laughs> these guys are fun to hang out with, but they're not my people. Yeah. Um, we've seen it on the water. We've seen it on the colony. We've seen it checking out burrows. So like it wants to breed there, but you know, I suspect it's nearest possible mate is about 3000 miles away. 
<laughs> I love or whatever the distance the, is. The idea of the, you know, just anything people are studying of them plotting against the scientists to be like, you know what, we should do this year. Let's like, let's get weird. And <laughs> we're going to mess do with something that. unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> but we do every year that we're out there, we do look. Uh, so one of the things that we use as a metric for active breeding burrows is a prey delivery. So if a tufted puffin comes into the colony, enters a burrow with fish in its bill, we know that there's a chick in the burrow and we don't have to actually manually get onto the island and check. Um, so whenever we're up at Smith Island um, and the, the horned puffin is around, we're always watching to see not only if it goes to the island, but if it ever has prey in the bill. To, because it could, hybridization isn't that uncommon in seabirds. So I think you just read Ellie's mind because Ellie. Oh, okay. So hybridize. <laughs> right. So it could be a, a horfted puffin or whatever. I don't know. What, um, oh, dear. But there hasn't been, at least, you know, in the time, and it's not like we're up there all the time, but its behavior every time we've been up there suggests that it's looking around, it's prospecting, it's interested, but it's not actively breeding. We've never seen it with fish in the bill. Jesse very funnily uh, commented that maybe the beluga told him it was a fun place to <laughs> Nice. <laughs> there you have it. Um, I love it. <laughs> And then finally, just a, a quick acknowledgement that April uh, has heard about your work um, and knows about, I guess, through, let me read this again. In Mount Rainier National Park, uh, they have documented marbled murelets breeding in the old growth forest there. Oh, which, they have. Um, is what a April says she heard a researcher talk about uh, your work in Mount Rainier National Park. So that could be cool. Um, although is noting that the uh, researcher wouldn't specify exactly where. So um, that, that is, would be interesting to follow up with. Yeah, because we, even Scott Pearson, who's, you know, with the state has a dozen, you know, because we've talked about it, like, where could they be breeding? And, you know, if anybody was aware of that, it would be Scott. Um, you know, I haven't, you know, because he's, he's working on the species on multiple levels. You know, I've just kind of, although I'm generally aware of what's going on with the species and its conservation in the state um, and its ecology, um, you know, this is for me a relatively recent entry into actually studying them formally. Um, but um, I'll, I'll follow up with that because th certainly that's the sort of habitat and those birds have the capacity to go in that far. Um, it, you know, Mount, the edges of Mount Rainier, especially on the west side, um, or Federation Forest State Park, you know, that sort of forest um, is prime marble merlet habitat. Awesome. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> Six April for that comment. Uh, and then I think there was one more from Sue, but I don't know why I can't find that in the, there's lots, lots of great questions, lots of comments here, lots of people uh, just uh, sharing the love. Thank you so much for such a great talk. Um, people, you know, well, and Steen, and learning Steen, and I having fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I appreciate that. And I, I mean, I love the questions and I just love that folks are enthusiastic and curious. Um, I mean, that's, you know, I feel as though, you know, again, as a conservation biologist, although I'm trained as, as a scientist, this is, this is where the greatest impact is. The science is only a small part of conservation. Um, it's, it's the awareness building and the getting people excited, engaged, and committed. That's where, that's where the science then becomes relevant. Because if we don't have that, the science isn't going to do anything. Um, so I, appreciate, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and I don't know if people saw in the, on my... I guess I, I could just put it up for a moment if yeah, folks that are still here, um, I'm just gonna screen share really quickly. If, if you do have additional questions or they come later or you know, there's questions that weren't addressed, um, I put just down at the bottom here, uh, my two work emails that I check both of them every day. Um, this is the nonprofit that I work with. Um, it's just peter at oikonos.org. And then you can also find me in the biology department if you ever need to do that. But, it's just phodom at pugetsound.edu. 
you know, feel free to drop me an email or give me a call if you want to follow up with a question or a comment or anything. Um, I'm, I'm here and I love to, you know, to chat and I appreciate folks' interest. Yeah, um, and you're, more, more people are chiming in with such an interesting talk. Thank you. Amazing information. Learned so much. Ellie will be using some things she learned in her tours this summer. So um, Excellent. I think you're absolutely Yay. right. But yeah, uh, the science doesn't mean anything if we're not sharing it. And I think you also talked about, you know, the, having the community involved. So uh, yes. I think a big cheers to seabirds. And again, thank you, Peter, so much for such a great presentation. Uh, I'm feeling a lot of people are feeling pumped about seabirds here, which is always so. So, lovely. so exciting. It's one of one of my missions in life. <laughs> awesome. So yes, thank thank you all. I appreciate you at your you attending and I appreciate your questions and your engagement. Um Stina, thank you to you and to Harbor Wild Watch for the opportunity. I, I greatly appreciate it. We appreciate you as well. So uh mutual <laughs> woohoo all around. <laughs> um, and then just I just have a couple quick announcements on some upcoming events on the Harbor Wild Watch end of things. Um, one that I wasn't gonna include, but since you mentioned forage fish, if anybody's interested in learning how to do those surveys, that's um, something we're adding to our community science repertoire uh, at the Fox Island site um, as they remove some seawall stuff. So we're learning more about forage fish this year and uh, cool. knowing that they're so important, this makes that work even more exciting. So definitely looking for volunteers in that world. So please email me if that strikes your fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then other things coming up, uh, we're partnering with Penn Met Parks to do a volunteer cleanup day at the at Fox Island Sandspit Demolay Nature Preserve. Uh, that is on February 26th from nine to noon. Bring your own gloves. We'll be removing invasive plant species as well as picking up trash. So that should be a lovely community effort there. Maybe we'll look for some seabirds along the way. Uh, and then we'll also be doing a digital beach walk at 9 p.m. on the 28th. So you can tune in to Facebook Live uh, and we'll give you a little night beach tour, which will be fun. Uh, and then, of course, next month, cocktails and fish tales. We'll be featuring Chris Gendry, who is one of our sea star students, all grown up studying <laughs> sea stars, which is just, I'm so tickled to get to say that out loud. That uh, is cool. But, yeah, he's uh, working with the Washington State Aquatic Reserves. And so we get to learn uh, kind of how that program helps, you know, the science and stewardship of things coming together to protect those cool places. So uh, tune in for that next month. But uh, for now, we'll just say thank you again, Peter. Thank you again, everybody, uh, for you. tuning in and all your great questions and comments and um, everything for tuning in. So uh, thanks again. I'm going to, this is where I awkwardly, everything changes every time. And I'm like, I don't actually see the button that says <laughs> end the don't show. Don't ask me, Stina. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, this is, uh, we might just end the Zoom because I really don't see where to. Uh, okay, I can, I can do, I'll, I'll leave. Okay. Thank you I'm everyone, leave whoever's still so. out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, Peter.